السلام علیکم خواتین حضرات وسیم ایس اینڈ ویلکم سی یو ٹو لیکچر نمبر 23 آف مارکیٹنگ فار نان پروفٹس ایم کے ٹی 628 ایٹ دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان دس کمپوننٹ آف لرننگ از گوئنگ ٹو بی این ایکسٹینشن آف دا ون آئی ٹاکڈ اباؤٹ ارلیئر اینڈ دیئر فور آئی ایم گن کانسنٹریٹ آن ٹو براڈ آسپیکٹس آف ریلیشن شپ مارکیٹنگ اینڈ انٹرنل مارکیٹنگ Let us start talking about the relationship marketing uh, and it goes without saying that this is a concept with which really has caught on over the last couple of decades. And the more the non-profit sector grows, the more the importance of relationship marketing. It's because of the simple reason that uh, it is because of maintaining long-term relationships that really uh, help uh, the organizations to sustain themselves. Relationship marketers uh, develop relations with different members of the audiences, starting from donors to volunteers to any other stakeholders that can be supportive toward the cause of the organization and thus help it achieve its mission. And the fact is, uh, many organizations find themselves with a short of uh, capable and uh, requisite human resource that could match the level of growth they have attained and they need to the talk with volunteers who can uh, offer support to the organization in terms of execution of the programs. In terms of donations, I think it goes without saying that uh, that happens to be the foremost factor uh, responsible for sustaining the organization because not all, all non-profits can generate uh, their own revenues to the level of 100%. And therefore, whatever is the deficit, which generally is the case, is covered through donations. So seeking donations with the help of uh, developing relationships is an important aspect. And that is something which is very obvious. However, the aspect of um, professional support in terms of uh, the doing different kinds of jobs within a nonprofit organization is something which uh, may be rather obscure to the many of us. Uh, the fact is that uh, a non-profit organization may seek support in the area of marketing, in the area of inventory management, supply chain, and uh, also in, in the area of uh, the finance. This is not to say that the organization is not really competent enough to carry out these jobs. It basically boils down to the fact that the organization is not fully equipped with the right human resource that can do all these jobs. For example, a nonprofit may have to revamp its systems and procedures when it comes to developing the supply chain. They have to do a lot of purchasing, they have to manage the inventories, and they have to ensure that whatever the need gets to the organization in time. And therefore, they may need the help of certain people, uh, I mean professionals like you, who may not be part of the organization, but who are willing to offer their expertise in developing um, whatever they want to develop in terms of systems and procedures. They may need support in terms of uh, developing a small feasibility report because they want to grow and they want to get into an area which is not yet uh, the part of the organization meaning organizational operations and therefore they need outside support. They do have a finance and accounting department that are doing their job of maintaining books, um, yearly accounts and all related uh, the documents and reports they generate from time to time. But 
they do not really have time to get into things like developing a feasibility report, which happens to be uh, something away from the mainstream of their responsibilities. Therefore, they may need to go to a professional who can render his or her service in developing that um, feasibility report. Another example, just to make the perspective very clear, they may have to contact people like you because they want to improve their uh, communication campaign. They know that they have to uh, talk with the different audiences, but they may not have the kind of professional expertise which you people have. And uh, it is you who are going to tell them they need to talk with uh, different audiences. And in order for them to talk with different members, they need to have tailor-made uh, campaigns that uh, are focused on uh, uh, particular uh, audiences. Like, you know, they need to have one campaign for donors, another one for volunteers, and yet another one for other stakeholders. And on top of that, they need to have a generic primary messaging platform which uh, talks a lot of sense and which carries all the ingredients of the organizational level as well as the identity level of brand raising process. To clarify the concept of uh, relationship marketing, I would like to draw a comparison between transactional marketing and relationship marketing. We know transactional marketing is a one-time thing. Uh, we make one transaction and it is over. This is not the case when you develop relationships. You develop relationships because you want to get into a long-haul uh, transactional mode. The basis still remains the carrying out of uh, transaction but on a repetitive basis over a long period of time. So in other words, you involve yourself the more with your audience and you extract a higher level of motivation and engagement out of your audiences because you want them to come to you again and again and buy your product. Now, how do they buy your product? Well, they make donations over and over again because they are bought into the concept or into the cause that you are selling. And therefore, they are loyal customers. They are paying you over and over again. And by the same token, you motivate volunteers to work for you over and over again for the same program or for different programs. It is not a one-time thing. Given the fact that relationship marketing is a long-term exercise, it makes it very obvious that it becomes the basis uh, on which organizations are sustained. And I would repeat it, just to summarize, you seek donations over and over again. You could make your volunteers more and more motivated so that they can work more and more. And don't forget, this kind of an exercise is less expensive, meaning it is cost effective, and it is the more effective in terms of uh, making uh, people uh, play their roles more efficiently because they're doing uh, one thing over and over again. And like uh, the brand loyal customer for whom you don't really have to carry out a lot of advertising. In other words, you, you don't really have to spend a lot of money in attracting uh, that uh, customer who is a loyal customer and automatically comes back to you for a repeat purchase. These um, members of the audiences uh, who are regular donors or who are regular volunteers are the ones who make the whole thing more efficient and cost effective. And therefore, we can say that uh, your engagement, meaning your involvement and engagement as marketing managers is of uh, a higher importance because you are playing the role in making them graduate from basically the preparation and action stage to the maintenance stage. And once they are into the maintenance stage, you start developing relationships. And this is exactly where the concept really fits in. Because maintaining such relationships is the essence of the whole marketing effort in terms of the personal persuasions. And the personal persuasion could be uh, much more effective than advertising, meaning paid advertising. And uh, needless to say that uh, this happens to be a step forward um, 
in terms of uh, the personal communications, we also can uh, take a look at uh, some new dimensions which uh, relationship marketing um, has uh, given a lot of impetus to. Uh, it is because of the uh, relationships that uh, we are in a position to talk with uh, that portion of the population that uh, has been uh, influenced uh, by our programs. Let's go back to the example of those uh, the key influencers uh, who play a very important role in uh, rehabilitating the druggies. Now, these are the people who were druggies themselves at one time. It is uh, because of their understanding of the program and their understanding of motivations of uh, those addicts uh, why they take to uh, drugs and therefore these um, influencers are in a better uh, position to play a very uh, positive role in uh, the making the change happen which is the ultimate goal of uh, any um, social marketing program. Another example of relationship marketing uh, is uh, from the academia. You know very well that uh, universities uh, like to develop relationships with uh, their students well beyond their um, scholastic years uh, because they want their uh, ex-students to uh, become uh, donors, uh, funders uh, to their cause. And uh, when that happens, they uh, bring in uh, more people because uh, they can influence uh, their peers into doing you know, what they are doing, meaning the making them donate toward that cause as well. And it doesn't stop there. It is because of the relationships that universities can engage their ex-students into programs of higher learnings and attract those ex-students to seminars, higher education the programs for executives, and uh, conferences, um, uh, thereby uh, making uh, that um, uh, audience uh, the more uh, uh, contributory toward uh, the cause and giving the cause the more credibility and a new dimension. So if you take a look at um, relationship marketing, you will realize that uh, it can do a very effective job in uh, uh, publicizing the nature of the cause and uh, the keeping different audiences engaged um, to the cause. Now, the question here is, if um, relationship marketing is that important, uh, we obviously need to have um, relationship managers who are uh, extremely competent in carrying out their responsibilities. And like I said, it is a step further from uh, the personal communications and therefore, you need to have the personal communicators who could be good at uh, developing relationships. The fact of life is that uh, we have um, different kinds of people within organizations. We have people who are uh, very energetic, outgoing, and uh, extroverted. Uh, then we have people who are introverted, uh, mild-mannered, and submissive these people are uh, far from energetic. Now, this is not to say that they are uh, incompetent people. No, they have different traits. And uh, if they cannot be the outgoing and uh, the ones you know, who should go out and develop relationships, they can do an excellent job of providing um, different sets of information to those who are entrusted with the responsibility of developing relationships. So everybody has to play their respective roles and uh, it is only a question of uh, who uh, is fit for what kind of a job. People who are um, very self-confident and uh, really uh, have a burning a desire to get rewards uh, against all odds, uh, the meaning uh, in situations which they know are going to be full of uh, resistance and obstacles, they still take the challenge and uh, they jump into it because they know just one thing, that they have to win over affections of people they talk with because they have to develop relationships. Now, in the words of an expert, these people know that uh, the people they talk with are not the ones who love them. But still, they go and uh, they try to develop relationships because 
they have to win them over. And that's the challenge which they must surmount. It is the part of their psychology. Now, in order to sustain relationships which uh, these people uh, develop, they have to do a few things which are extremely important because they keep uh, their audiences engaged to the cause. And uh, one of the important things that these people do is uh, offering uh, acknowledgement to their uh, uh, the members of the audience who uh, work for the organization or who donate on um, a regular basis or who contribute in any the one particular sense toward supporting the cause of the organization. And uh, this acknowledgement mostly is done by giving them certificates of acknowledgement uh, for rendering a particular service uh, toward the cause and uh, by giving mementos or uh, even prizes at times, uh, making the whole thing uh, public uh, in order to uh, make others uh, motivated as much as uh, these people are. Um, and uh, giving them a sense of uh, uh, patronizing the cause of the organization. When these people, meaning members of the audience who have been acknowledged for the service they have rendered, when they realize that they have been acknowledged as the patrons toward the cause, they feel even more motivated and they become even more committed to the cause. And uh, this goes without saying, when that happens, they bring into the fold even more people who uh, like to follow them in their footsteps. So okay, we can say this is a great platform from where marketing people can um, not just could motivate um, their existing members of the audiences, could, but also can um, could bring in could more people into the fold who may follow into the footsteps of uh, motivated audiences. And uh, marketing people therefore should uh, could spare no effort in uh, the trying to uh, put together all the reinforcers uh, which can uh, be shaped up as uh, certificates of acknowledgement or mementos or rewards of uh, different kinds. The basic idea here is to acknowledge uh, what those people have done. And uh, once they're acknowledged as uh, the patrons, the, the word of mouth advertising done by those people goes uh, miles and miles in terms of bringing promotional mileage to the cause. The next um, area I pointed out earlier is uh, internal with the marketing. As much important as uh, the personal communication and uh, relationship marketing, internal marketing also has acquired a new dimension with the realization that uh, all those people within any organization who come into contact with uh, the stakeholders play a marketing role. Why? Because they, at their point of contact, talk about things which are going on within the organization. And anything that goes on within the organization is part of the program. And therefore, these people can be good key influencers uh, supplementing the efforts carried out by the marketing department. So the marketing job is not just confined to the marketing department per se, uh, good uh, the marketing managers think and are convinced that all the points of context within the organization have got to be uh, highlighted. And toward that, they carry out an audit of the organization, deliberate to see uh, all the points uh, where uh, all such interactions take place uh, between uh, the people uh, from the organization and stakeholders, and then try to highlight the marketing effort which uh, such people should carry out in coordination with the marketing department. And it is not difficult to carry out this kind of an audit. We know the purchasing people within the organization are in touch with suppliers day in and day out. Now, do not lose sight of the fact that your suppliers also can happen to be your donors at the same time. And your suppliers may also like to be the part of the um, execution team of uh, the volunteers because uh, they think it is a noble cause. They're doing business with the organization. They are uh, selling you uh, certain parts, um, offering certain supplies. Uh, 
um, that's part of business. But then, uh, working for the noble cause, they, they may also offer their services in some other shape and form. People from the accounts and finance get into contact with uh, uh, all those uh, the possible uh, the stakeholders uh, the who um, get into contact with the organization and uh, the same is the case uh, with uh, any other uh, department that uh, has the potential to talk with uh, stakeholders. I mean, the only department that uh, they may not have uh, a lot of interaction with uh, stakeholders is uh, the one that is uh, involved in developing your uh, computerized systems. Uh, you can say that, that they happen to be a back office uh, that uh, is uh, concentrated on a certain objective of the organization um, cut off from the stakeholders in terms of talking about the program or involving themselves with uh, the day-to-day -day activities uh, in terms of uh, uh, carrying out uh, the businesses uh, or different dimensions of uh, the organizational businesses or operations. And therefore, they, they may be the only people uh, who may not play that kind of a role, but even they have to know uh, the marketing effort and they must also know uh, what the mission of the organization is and uh, what is the um, elevator pitch because in their off hours, when they interact with um, stakeholders or uh, uh, with any uh, with the portions of uh, the population at large, they, they may say a few things uh, that uh, they may carry a certain level of influence and uh, they may motivate people to do something for the organization. Anyway, my uh, point here is that uh, the points of contact within the organization have got to be highlighted by the marketing department and they have to come up with kind of a training course for all those people who occupy those points of contact where interaction with the outer world takes place. And uh, they should uh, make them kind of an extended uh, portion of the marketing team. And uh, the fact is that organizations who are um, sensitive to this particular development and can um, develop um, this uh, supplement uh, to their um, permanent uh, the marketing force are in a better position to evoke uh, a higher level of positive responses uh, for the cause than those uh, who cannot do all this. So internal uh, the marketing uh, carries uh, a very high level of uh, uh, significance in terms of influencing uh, your uh, audiences okay, because of uh, their existence, mere existence in the department and for the fact that they interact with them. And during those interactions, anything they talk has to be centered on the cause. Now, let us uh, take a look at uh, the overall impact of uh, the three uh, the factors of uh, the personal communications. Uh, the meaning uh, the personal communications, relationship marketing, and internal uh, the marketing. Well, the fact is that uh, the cumulative effect of uh, the total effort uh, is uh, uh, much greater than the sum of its parts. For the simple reason that uh, it uh, works a lot toward the concept that we all know, BCOS, benefits, costs, others, and self-efficacy. If you can recall that particular concept, the fact is that the cumulative impact of the three uh, factors of uh, the personal uh, communications uh, can have uh, a lot of uh, influence on uh, what we call others. Do you know why? Because uh, given the efforts undertaken by the external marketing people here, the external marketing people are the people from the organization because they are external for the audiences who have been influenced. Now, assume that the bottom line of the efforts undertaken by the marketing people is the behavioral outcome that we desire, then you have achieved the results, meaning the external marketers have achieved the end result. 
and the change of behavior has taken place. When that happens, it automatically means that there are people who have adopted the behavior. The new adopters of the behavior are known as the new influencers. And as a matter of fact, you know, they are the key influencers and they take the place of the external marketers who in the first place started the program. And uh, their importance uh, from that point onwards diminishes. And the importance of uh, the key influencers from within the society um, increases. And uh, when that happens, uh, the impact of two more concepts um, really uh, starts uh, taking hold. Uh, one is okay, the word of mouth and okay, we know the power of uh, the impact of okay, the word of mouth uh, in advertising. It is uh, okay, the not uh, the really uh, the formal paid advertising uh, carried out by the department uh, um, of marketing. It is something to which people talk out of their conviction. They are so much satisfied with the product they have bought, the meaning the program they have been subjected to, that they talk about the outcome. The others they see that new behavior performed day in and day out. And as a result of that, they also they like to be new adopters of the behavior. And even if they have to ask a lot of questions to the early adopters, they can ask them by dissecting the whole uh, the program and then uh, the follow in the footsteps of the early adopters to the benefit of the, the marketing people who originally uh, set the program in. And uh, this is um, uh, something which uh, takes us uh, to the proof of uh, social power. And that is the other concept that I referred to earlier. Um, the um, social power is uh, something that uh, makes uh, many people to follow into the footsteps of all those people who are early adopters. And most of the people like to follow others. And when they realize it is something that offers a benefit or a set of benefits, they like to follow the behavior. Let us now talk about uh, non-personal communications. Uh, in other words, paid advertising, which is done through paid media. And uh, we all know that uh, we classify paid media in terms of uh, electronic media, print media, online media, and a host of other uh, traditional tools that we put together in order to communicate with uh, our audiences. Here, the concentration is going to be on uh, the advertising. And therefore, uh, we can classify advertising in a non-profit context into four different areas. The one is what we may call charitable advertising, and the other one is private non-profit advertising, and the third one is association advertising, and the fourth one is social cause advertising. What is the difference? Well, we all know that we have different advertising approaches, or for that matter, communication approaches for different audiences, but then you see, we also need to understand under what circumstances we advertise and what kind of resources we need to uh, the muster in order to advertise uh, the, our uh, campaigns. In um, charitable advertising, uh, it, we certainly go for uh, generating donations uh, the, on a regular basis or also uh, in emergency situations uh, because uh, the, we need to have uh, the money uh, the, for a charitable cause. And that is why uh, the, we give that particular advertising the terminology that I just talked about. The second one is. Uh, Private non-profit advertising. This kind of advertising is uh, basically done by institutions like uh, the education. Uh, for example, uh, your university, uh, the virtual university advertises a lot in terms of offering uh, different uh, the programs or in terms of also talking about the testimonials uh, given by ex-students and so on and so forth. Yeah. By uh, healthcare units, uh, the hospitals, uh, the even uh, the museums in the, uh, the Western world, or for that matter, uh, uh, religious the faith organizations, they talk about uh, the, their uh, the particular uh, uh, lines on which uh, they want to attract uh, the people and uh, the spread uh, the, what they think is uh, the very noble cause and they like to advertise. And uh, the, you see a lot of uh, the print uh, media the here and there in um, uh, towns um, carrying uh, their uh, the particular message. 
And the third one is um, association advertising. This is the kind of advertising undertaken by different associations, because we know it from our understanding, from uh, one of the preliminary components of learning, that uh, associations basically are non-profit organizations. Even though they can represent um, industries that happen to be very resourceful and rich, um, but associations are registered as uh, the non-profit organizations. And therefore, uh, in most of the cases, associations uh, happen to be also resourceful. And uh, they advertise uh, their cause, uh, their causes uh, from time to time. And to give you one example, I would like to draw your attention toward different kinds of appeals uh, which different associations are uh, going to make to the higher ups or uh, even to the highest authority of the government uh, in the newspapers, drawing their attention to certain problems they are facing. And uh, the fourth one is uh, a, a kind of advertising, which is a new concept. Uh, but, but the fact is, it is uh, the most interesting uh, part of the whole um, advertising effort undertaken by nonprofits. And this is what we call social cause advertising. This may sound like uh, something extremely generic, but uh, the fact is, it uh, is a new concept and it happens to be the most interesting of the uh, overall advertising effort undertaken by uh, nonprofits. Uh, this works like the following. You basically create an association which is responsible to carry out advertising on behalf of different causes. And uh, these causes uh, they may spring up on a very wide spectrum, uh, carrying areas like uh, the education, the health, environment, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, the fact is that uh, this association uh, does not really pay for the advertising they undertake. And at the same time, um, nonprofits uh, who are uh, following those causes from the areas that I just talked about do not pay for that. This association basically is entrusted with the responsibility of contacting advertising agencies, uh, promotion agencies, and uh, the event management companies, and also media seek their support toward undertaking the whole effort. So in other words, they are in touch with uh, the advertising and promotion agencies so that are going to help the association with uh, the developing uh, the ads for um, uh, different causes. And uh, then they are in contact with uh, the media to uh, place those ads. They are in contact with television, with radio, with uh, the other online tools, and at the same time, they are, they are in contact with uh, the print media and so on and so forth. So uh, what I'm saying is uh, the beauty of the concept lies in uh, making the whole thing uh, free of cost. Um, and uh, the association uh, works on uh, the donations uh, which are made by um, donors. And uh, again, the communication, this kind of an associ association uh, may have to uh, undertake, it has to be extremely convincing and powerful. Uh, because uh, they are kind of a third entity. They are the, uh, the go-between uh, who are uh, working on behalf of different uh, non-profits and they sell the basic idea uh, behind different causes to advertising agencies and the media and uh, they make those uh, the programs uh, more visible and uh, heard among their respective audiences. With uh, this understanding of uh, different uh, kinds of uh, advertising approaches uh, in a nonprofit context, uh, let's now uh, proceed uh, to the concept of establishing advertising objectives. The reason uh, I want to talk about uh, how we establish our objectives is because uh, they want to advance our understanding toward uh, making budgets. Uh, you remember I did talk about um, sticking to the budgetary exercise uh, the while we undertake our communication process because we would like to be extremely confident and sure about the kind of money we have and uh, the kind of tools of uh, experiential level that uh, we can put together and uh, afford all of them within our constraints. And anything which we are not in a position to do, we seek others' help. And we must know where we draw the line, we cut off, uh, with our resources and start getting uh, resources from other sources and therefore the need for very specific uh, budgets. 
In this background, we can say that uh, advertising objectives flow out of two primary factors. The one is the target market and the other one is uh, the positioning of the program. These uh, two factors could basically define to what extent we should go for advertising and the kind of money that we need to um, advertise the program. And therefore, the size of uh, the budget uh, basically uh, stems from the objectives that we put together. And I think we, we don't really need to have a lot of um, debate on uh, why it is positioning the which uh, defines advertising objectives. Uh, if we have uh, a complete clarity on the concept, then uh, it is very obvious there are certain positionings uh, which may not call for a heavy amount of advertising, whereas there are ones uh, which will call for a huge level of advertising. Uh, however, given the constraints, it is the responsibility of the marketing department of the organization to what extent uh, they can really afford advertising for their particular program. It basically is the target market which uh, we need to understand in better clarity in relation to the advertising objectives and then budgeting. Because this also uh, takes us to the overall exercise of uh, the marketing mix. Now here, one question may flash into your mind why I'm talking about marketing mix. Well, let's go back to the concept and we know that one of the P's is promotions and that's where advertising fits in. So depending upon the extent and the magnitude of advertising that we think that we should be putting together and the size of the budget, could we come up with a complete marketing mix for the overall program? And uh, therefore, um, you know, everything has its uh, the ripple effects and uh, um, affect the other variables. Back to the, the target market, uh, we need to define it, uh, like I said, uh, in the context of advertising a little bit more. And uh, three you know, factors that uh, we need to comprehend here are uh, the target market selection, target response, and uh, the target reach and frequency. Why is it that uh, we really need to uh, be clear about target market selection? Because uh, we must know uh, where they are and who they are. If they happen to be in a remote area, then the tools that we put together for advertising are going to be different, and hence, very different kinds of objectives. And um, another example of the target market selection is the uh, level of uh, the education of the target market. If they happen to be highly educated people who are also uh, the tech savvy, that really uh, will shift our objectives uh, from one-to-one uh, uh, -one contact to the things like uh, the online tools. And therefore, uh, the, uh, the shift in advertising objectives or rather concentration of advertising objectives on the basis of the target market we are going to be dealing with. Um, therefore, who they are and where they are is, is extremely important. And then the factor of uh, the kind of different publics that uh, they could be. Uh, for example, they could be individuals, they could be different groups, and uh, they could be the different huge chunks of audiences that we are trying to communicate with. And uh, this is an area that I have covered a lot in detail, and uh, I'm sure that you are, you are experts on this particular aspect, that uh, you need to have different communications for different audiences because we need to talk about things which motivate that particular audience and we do not really cause overlaps that are meant for different audiences. Those are the kind of things that we talk as part of our primary and generic messaging platform. And therefore, to summarize selection of the target market, you know, what really can be said in very plain words that we've got to be clear about what to say, when to say, the way to say, and who should say it. And uh, I would like to draw your attention toward uh, testimonials. So, uh, this is part of uh, who should say it. Uh, I just talked about uh, one example in the context of advertising from your particular university. You will recall testimonials uh, by your ex-students uh, who are uh, enjoying good positions and they talk about their placements owing everything to the university's program. And uh, this could be the one example of choosing the right target audience and then the working on um, the right advertising tool or vehicle. The next factor is that of uh, the target response. Extremely significant, 
uh, because uh, the marketing people in advance uh, has to be clear about the kind of response they think you know, they should be getting. Um, they will never get a uh, response you know, which is uh, absolutely satisfying in the 100% terms. But the fact is they are basically working for a behavioral outcome. And uh, I'm not intentionally using the terminology behavioral change. You know, it automatically means, you know, the outcome is going to be there, but to what extent? That is something, you know, they should be uh, clear about. The kind of response, you know, they will get. And in order to be clear about the kind of response that they should get, it takes us back to the behavior change model. And therefore, the advertising that we should put together has to be in line with the stage where our audience happens to be. And uh, therefore, we pick advertising tools and put our objectives accordingly. We have one set of objectives for people who are into contemplation stage and uh, by the same token, your different sets of objectives for the next stage and the next. And uh, the response level, therefore, has got to be uh, established in advance, which uh, gives marketing people a lot of clarity in terms of putting together numbers that they are talking about. But you know, because here we are talking about establishing objectives toward determining our advertising and marketing budget. The third factor which forms the target market, of course, is the target market reach and uh, frequency. Again, a very important factor because it is here that the marketing people are faced with the uh, formidable challenge of uh, determining again in advance uh, the, what kind of reach they are expecting. Um, there is hardly any the marketing organization that really can have you know, outreach uh, spread over 100% uh, geographical area or 100% of their audiences, wherever they are, even if they are not uh, the sparsely you know, situated. Um, they have to be clear about the kind of uh, the percentage of reach they think or rather they envisage that they will um, achieve and that uh, the brings a lot of uh, clarity into establishing objectives by the same token another factor uh, which is a part of this uh, uh, you know the variable is uh, that of uh, frequency as to how frequently we go for the advertising exposure exposure over a certain period of time now, this basically is uh, established uh, with uh, the kind of uh, potential which uh, the different segments of the market uh, offer us as uh, the marketing uh, the people. We must know um, uh, the potential level of uh, the different segments. And if you go back to the uh, segmentation exercise, uh, we uh, will realize that um, segment A, for example, uh, may dictate that the frequency of advertising should be double that of um, the exposure given to segment B, because the potential for segment B is not as that great. As a matter of fact, you see the potential of segment B is half that of segment A. And hence, you know, half of advertising for the potential uh, of for the segment, which is weaker, and uh, double the exposure uh, for the segment having uh, a higher level of potential, the meaning potential of uh, response. So this is how you establish uh, your uh, advertising objectives. And uh, I would like to uh, summarize uh, once again um, uh, the uh, basic variables that uh, the form our target market and then uh, become the broad basis of our advertising objectives. And those are the target market selection and uh, it may sound very simple, but I would like to uh, rub this in over and over again. This is where many marketing people uh, start taking things for granted and go wrong. Uh, and therefore, we've got to be very sensitive to drawing lines between different segments of the market that we are going to be dealing with and be very clear about uh, the one that we want to pick for the advertising or communication exercise. The other variable is the target response, uh, the meaning um, the response uh, level in terms of uh, 
the target uh, market being at uh, one particular stage of the behavior change model. And the third variable is that of uh, uh, target reach and uh, the frequency. Reach cannot be 100%, but it's got to be made optimal. And could we make it optimal could by looking at the response level of different segments or different portions, or different sub-segments within an overall segment, and then decide uh, which uh, sub-segment or which portion uh, deserves a higher level of advertising exposure in order to make our advertising exercise more optimal and effective. With this, we are all set to go for putting together our uh, budget. How do we put together budget? I think it is a simple exercise uh, which uh, we have learned from uh, other courses as well. And in terms of an advertising budget, which is part of the overall marketing budget, I think you know, what we have to keep in mind is that we uh, go for a cost spread all across the, the categories or all across the uh, communication and advertising tools that we think that we have to put together to uh, come up with a comprehensive or an integrated uh, with a marketing campaign, uh, meaning a marketing communication campaign. Uh, if we think that we're going to confine to the online tools and alongside with that, uh, the portions of uh, the print media, okay, so be it. If we think you know, that we need to have uh, our presence uh, spread all across um, uh, the available tools, uh, then the uh, budget is going to uh, contain all those categories with costs associated. In other words, could we go for a cost spread that specifies all the tools of the experiential level that are going to be part of our specific advertising campaigns all around the year. And could we talk about uh, the different um, uh, cost factors uh, the month by month. And uh, could we specify them uh, broken into the parts and subparts so that we have a lot of clarity in terms of for the executing of our campaigns so that when we start comparing what we had budgeted with what we have achieved because once we are into the execution mode we are extremely clear about the variances and that is the beauty of the budget that's why we come up with the budget so that we know uh, we are on the right line and the moment we are off track okay, when we see a huge variance from what we had budgeted there is something wrong and that is uh, where we stop and start thinking what really has caused this erroneous situation. So that's the beauty of budgets. Now a few more words about uh, the budgeting. You divide your costs not in terms of uh, just the advertising and communication tools but you also talk in terms of geographical spread. In other words if you are working for a cost which is national then you have to talk about your advertising budgets and tools which are going to be used for um, a wider spread uh, all across the uh, geographical regions. And then again, depending upon the response level, you establish the kind of uh, uh, the budgets or the amount of uh, uh, the uh, rupee spread which you associate with each um, region and uh, also uh, with the tools. All these details uh, have to be uh, the part of the budget so that uh, you can later on track and monitor your own developments that uh, you had planned as uh, the part of the budgetary process.